Hello and welcome to the Music Works podcast. I'm Katie Beardsworth, director and founder of Polyphony Arts, and this week I'm handing over Music Works to two women who are working to address how we can improve our working structures, both as an industry and within the area of community orchestras and amateur music making, to promote greater diversity and inclusivity. Conductor and academic Kayana Ponchion Bailey is emblematic of the 21st century's newest vanguard of orchestral leadership. Working to advance social justice and environmental sustainability within music, both on and off the podium, her bold orchestral initiatives fuse the local with the global, amplify leading environmental research and engage with the pressing issues of our time. Margaret Pinder is no stranger to the Music Works studio as our podcast manager and occasional guest speaker. Here, she is also wearing her hat as the chair of the Hull Philharmonic Society, one of the country's leading community orchestras, where she and the managing committee are working to bring classical music to a wider audience and challenging traditional attitudes to music making in the process. Together, they'll be looking at how ensembles negotiate and collaborate in the immediate process of performance, how hierarchies we take for granted within the performing unit can influence the hierarchies we adopt beyond, and how these can and should be challenged. And stay tuned as they share their thoughts on how we can move to a more flexible, more inclusive musical space and the important role of community music in the UK. But first, here's a message from our sponsor. Music Works is generously supported by Alliance Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Alliance offer a team of music experts who understand musicians' needs and lifestyles, especially helpful during the strange times we're in. You can get cover for all types of instruments and musical equipment with protection against accidental damage, loss, theft and more. And, unlike home insurance, there's no excess to pay on instrument or accessory claims. At the moment, Allianz have a special online offer with two months free cover. Not only that, every Allianz music policy now includes free legal assistance and support so you can protect yourself, both as a musician and in your personal life. Find out more at alliancemusic.co.uk. Alliance, serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. And now let's go over to the Music Works studio where Kayana Ponchion Bailey and Margaret Pinder are waiting to talk to us. Hello, Kayana. Today I'm standing in for Katie Beardsworth for the podcast, so it's my very great pleasure to welcome Kayana Ponchion Bailey to the Music Works studio. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation. We've spoken before, and um, so here we here we are. Welcome. Thank you so much, Margaret, and thank you very much for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Well, I think we we're very interested in some of the work you've been doing and some of the research you've been doing about hierarchies in music, women in music, um, and the work of community or- orchestras. I mean, there's just lots of material there that's. Uh, really interesting and I think very important for you know how we sort of progress our vision of music how people place themselves with the music how they structure sort of authority within music um yes so I think one of the first things we were talking about when we were talking earlier was about how musicians place themselves when they're actually playing together which I thought was an interesting take yeah, well, it, it is. Um, it's a really interesting topic, actually. And and Margaret, what you touch on was actually the subject of my doctoral work at the University of Oxford um, a number of years ago now, um, in which I explored what it is that prompts musicians to make the decisions that they do about kind of how, so how they characterize and precisely when they play their part. So it's looking at what influences musicians' decision making in the moment of performance or in a rehearsal process. Um, And the reason why that's so fascinating is it really starts to get into questions of artistic authorship um, and how kind of authority and influence um, kind of uh, works on the ground in those spaces. Yeah, I think that's fascinating because we tend to think about that in terms of how we manage our lives outside the actual direct musical space. Um, But your work is you're actually looking about how the two are connected interlinked so i'd love you to unpack that a bit 
Yeah, for sure. No, it is interesting because I think what we see when we go to an orchestra concert is we see um, this very neat kind of hierarchy. You've got the conductor there waving their arms. They're clearly giving information to the orchestra um, who is you know, organized in, in pretty neat rows or sections uh, with leaders of each one of those. And it seems like there's a very kind of clear line of communication that, that really works from top to bottom. Um, and maybe even kind of outside in terms of the social aspects of how we organize music, that also seems quite clear. Um, but in that real sort of messiness of real life music making, information is flying all around the show in an orchestra and people are needing to kind of pick up on various bits um, here and there to, to really know how to keep the ensemble together. And I think this is going to sound really simple, but it actually cannot be overestimated, which is that in an orchestra, any group of 80 or 100 or even 60 people, the likelihood that we're all going to agree on what we're doing or all going to have the same vision for what that performance outcome should be is really unlikely. Um, an orchestra is a place, uh, interestingly, that has a not so much capacity for harmony that we, we like to think of orchestras being very harmonious, large ensembles, large organizations, um, but actually has the capacity to sustain difference, which I think is really um, an interesting sort of a flip side to the ways in which we often think about orchestral performance. But if there is one sort of kind of shared goal, that shared goal is going to be about staying together. It's as simple as that, that, you know, that if you know when push comes to shove the number one thing we're going to do as a group is we're going to get through this piece from beginning to end we're going to play together we're going to play as in some cases as precisely together as possible although with my with my hat on as a former postdoctoral researcher on a late 19th century historically informed performance project the concept of togetherness is actually quite different um but still there is there is in some sense a shared goal, goal of what togetherness might be um, but beyond that, how we get there is going to differ a lot for each individual and people bring various um, kind of different uh, previous experiences, different knowledges, uh, different motivations uh, into the rehearsal and performance hall, which really shape how they go about achieving that goal of togetherness. Yeah, I think that's interesting because we all like to the narrative of music is all about harmony and cooperation and collaboration. And, and it is, I mean, that is one of the great achievements, but what it, the subtext, what you're highlighting is the flip side of that is that how it's a constant resolution of tensions mm. within the, uh, you know, within the discourse, the musical discourse of any single ensemble performance. You know that that's how i understand what you're saying and i think that that's actually quite an interesting take on it yeah a, a resolution of tensions or perhaps a negotiation of tensions yeah. or kind of negotiating um what people are offering so i mean in in real temporal terms um there is not time for everybody in the orchestra to hear and then respond or follow to what everybody else is doing actually everybody has to be imagining and uh, kind of a um, anticipating what's going to happen. They have to have a very developed sense for themselves of what sound they're going to contribute at any particular moment prior to doing it. You can't wait for the leader of the first violins to you know, play the way those semiquavers are gonna go and then respond. You actually have to co-articulate them precisely in time within milliseconds. And so actually everybody's coming to this with pretty um, developed ideas, whether or not they are, are kind of intentional or, or conscious of that, it's part of what it's what's necessary so so people are continually offering they they are um contributing these musical ideas as opposed to just kind of responding to something that happened or following um and and as people are doing that there's a, a real negotiate a temporal negotiation you know time is created not by the conductor the conductor can suggest a time, suggest a tempo, suggest a when, um, and uh, then time is created when people make that sound. So you can be in a situation perhaps where actually the, the, the real influence within the ensemble is, of course, those people that have the motor rhythms, those people who can't necessarily move or stretch too much without really disrupting the flow of the music making. And that really shapes then what a melody or counter melody line might have the capacity to do. If somebody is kind of sticking to one sort of regimen or one idea of what the tempo should be, 
<clears throat> regardless of whether or not they happen to be the third violist or that sort of thing, that could really then shape the entire characterization of, of a performance. Uh, because other people, in order to keep the orchestra together and not fall apart, they have to take different choices, which then, yeah, really, really shape the, the, the feel of the music. Oh, yeah, definitely, because Sam Smicky is the bass player. And the thing about yes. the bass is we, we can really change how the orchestra is playing. If, if, often if a conductor needs it to pull back or speed up, <laughs> they'll look at the basses. This is like, guys, we really need you to start doing the heavy lifting from behind. And I think what you're saying is right. And of course, it becomes even more complex when the orchestra is accompanying a soloist, mm. because that negotiation is happening on more levels. And I think that's why we were talking about this in rehearsal at the whole Philharmonic this week about how in the past, the orchestra, we had soloists that we just that the orchestra tended to, and a lot of orchestras do this, they just rehearse the concerto when the soloists arrive, which is obviously often doing them a great disservice because the orchestra hasn't had time to actually discover their own part and work through and, and form those, bring those ideas and work them out in the context of the orchestra, which is why sometimes those performances can get a bit sticky because the orchestra is trying to do too much with the soloist, you know, because they're all focused on the soloist and they haven't really had a chance to work through their own, as you say, I like this word negotiation, negotiate their own place within themselves and then put that in relation to the soloist. Yes, and of course the comp what gets complicated there too is the ways in which people listen to that soloist and interact with that soloist, um, both in terms of who do you, are you, are you prioritizing uh, the when and the what of the soloist over the information that's coming from the conductor? Um, are you prioritizing what the leader is suggesting the orchestra should do over the soloist? How are you as an individual player making your decision about who, whose influence you're going to accept, especially when they are not aligned? And that can change over the course of you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or 30 seconds um, when when things aren't aligned and you have to make a split second decision about who you're going to go with and how. Um, and that's I think that's the thing that that is really different, perhaps, than what you might imagine an orchestra rehearse or an orchestra performance represents, which is kind of a perhaps a reproduction of something that's all been worked out in rehearsal, mm -hmm. looks all quite organized. And yes, we decided to do it this way. And therefore, here it is, folks. Um, and the reality is a lot of times orchestras may not even play through all the notes before the performance. There isn't a fully worked out plan necessarily, although there may be some shared ideas about how we'll probably get through a particular transition or what sort of bow stroke we're going to go for here, or that sort of thing. But um, in large measure, particularly in, uh, you know, in, in orchestral cultures in which rehearsal is rehearsal time is at a minimum. And I would say in the UK, we are really good at having the most minimal amount of rehearsal possible. <laughs> yeah. You know, why would you rehearse? Um, but um, but but I it also enables in a way it facilitates that in the moment freedom. It's almost there's much more sort of improvisation that goes into this than I think a lot of people expect. Um, what I was going to say was that that they're thinking about that the soloist situation but actually thinking about individual players one of the the things especially in in highly professional ensembles or or you know uh, players that have been doing orchestral work for a long time that have made this their profession um, rather than just knowing their part they know a lot about the entire orchestral score the context they have a really deep awareness of what role their part is playing within that orchestral texture um you know down to what what part of of the chord they play and actually how that they can then anticipate how to tune that chord and whether or not they're going to have to raise pitch a little bit or drop it a little bit because of their role um with within the harmonic context um and it's that sort of level of of knowledge that makes it possible for our orchestras to do what they do today because people aren't just coming having learned their notes but actually they have a really deep knowledge of of that entire work um and can listen to and respond to they know who to listen to and why 
um, and it wouldn't matter who's on the podium conducting them. They can actually hold that together. And actually, that's a really important point, which is to say, when we're looking at kind of authority in the orchestra, um, let's just take an example of, of someone like the LSO or, or any orchestra which has perhaps a, a distinctive sound, a USP, a distinctive brand. It is essential. It is number one that every day they live up to um, those standards, that they sound like the LSO, no matter who is been put on the podium in front of them and how they're doing that day. Um, and that I think, or or you know, what substitutes they might have, or this or the other thing, I think that can't be underestimated in terms of the ways in which people then um, evaluate the type of information that's coming in and the effect that it might have, the impact it might have on those priorities. Yeah, we'll come we'll come on to hierarchy uh, in a minute, but I I just what what this makes me think of is how we've all had those terrifying moments in a performance where you can feel it starting to come unstuck at the seams. Something has gone wrong and you and you know, you got kind of looking I find myself looking down the line of bases going, What? <laughs> I'm saying, what is happening? And the outlook comes back. <laughs> but somehow something happens that does pull it back together. And you can feel it. It's almost like a psychic. So when you're playing, you're already kind of, as you say, I'm sure this is why music is good for brain, you know, good for your mental health. Your people who practice music, you know, it, it stops you, it keeps it staves off dementia and, you know, kids learn better when they do music. Your brain's already, you know, whizzing away with all the issues of performance that you've just enunciated, that you've just recited for us. And then suddenly when it starts to come adrift, you go into sort of like hyperspace. And that communication suddenly increases and it does come back together. And afterwards you all go, what the hell happened there? Mm. And you all sort of laugh about it. You, you, well, you laugh if it did come, but it does come back together. And I think that's a really a strict point because you can't put your finger on what happened because it probably wasn't the conductor actually, mm. but it was probably something that, you know, it's almost like, the mycelium, it's like, you know, the, the, the mushroom, the underground um, net that connects all the trees and all living things. We have that kind of musical mycelium that connects us all. And all those messages suddenly sort of speed up and pull it back together. Uh, but you can never put your finger on exactly what it was that got it back together. I remember one of um, the people that I interviewed uh, for my doctorate um, talking about, um, you know, one of the first things they had to really figure out when they got into uh, the, their the first professional orchestra they were in was um, trying to figure out actually who everybody else is listening to. You know, what 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 is it that we all collectively need to hold on to to be able to, to do this together? Um, and if you end up listening to somebody else or listening in a different way, it can really mean that things can pull apart. Um, and even thinking in a different way, I remember an episode where, um, and I'm going to forget the exact piece, and I'm sorry about that, but it was a six tup sex tuplet. So we'll have um, six semi-quavers in a row, zagada dagada or zagada dagada daga. Really yeah. important distinction. And mm -hmm. in this particular case, they were all detaché, um, but one section, the, 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 the um, first desk of cellos, was thinking in groups of three, zagada dagada and the violas were thinking them in groups of two, zega, dega, dega. They were playing them basically in time, but it wasn't together because yeah. they were actually grouping mentally in their heads. And so they had a chat about that, like, how are you thinking of these? And once they agreed how to think about them, then they that it was able to to, to come together. Um, but it's it's those types of things, surprisingly, that are what can actually throw an ensemble even for a loop, you know, if you get it, if you had a similar sort of thing within, you know, um, you know, the b double bass section that was actually providing that motor line that everybody needed to lock into, and it just wasn't settling. It could have been something as simple as yeah. people were thinking about the rhythm being grouped in different ways, um, yeah. and 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 that's um, uh, yeah, thinking about you know how how things happen, what what are the things that cause things to to fall apart. Um, and they can be huge things like the conductor cues somebody at the wrong time or somebody makes the wrong entrance, um, or it can be something as subtle as uh, as people thinking about, you know, rhythmic groupings. Not yeah, no, that's, it's a bit like the infamous opening of Beethoven 5. 
yeah. where when people quote it, they always go one, two, three, one, and it's not, it's and two and one. Yes. And if you say, you go, what's the difference? It's like, oh, it's massive. It's a huge yes. difference. Can you not hear <laughs> yeah. the difference? Yeah, it's that kind of conversation. So, yeah, hierarchy. So let's move on. Wow. So how does this translate? Because obviously hierarchy is a big deal. It's obviously a big deal music within, you know, as we've discussed, but also it's how musicians see themselves, how musical organisations see themselves, the role of tradition, and of course, how you expand, because as we know, classical music is incredibly hidebound. It's very much rooted in tradition, for good or, but sometimes ill. So it's one of the areas, so when you're trying to expand, say, diversity, especially the role of women, I think that's when it you when you start investigating it starts it helps you look at an awful lot of things that still need looking at yes what does authority look like in the orchestra is a really important question and i think it does come to you know as i muse on this not just um as a female conductor working in what has been historically a a very uh, male dominated industry and um, career, um, sorry, not career, I'm sorry, uh, working working as a female in what has been historically a very male-dominated <laughs> profession, um, the, it, it really, you really do think, how do I embody um, a certain authority that people will feel comfortable with, respond to intuitively and instinctively. And and actually when we start looking at those questions, um, I think we get some really uncomfortable answers. Um, what is it that we we need from our conductors? And and I would go so far as to say that that um, sometimes we expect that conductor to be a a, a focal point for our our most important transcendent experiences and when we look across the professions of the sorts of people who in, embody those roles um and and not not to put myself in the role the realm of any religious leader but to make an analogy between actually our expectations of who a conductor might be versus somebody per, who who um is is a you know a, a priest or um, a bishop or somebody who has that sort of role within a spiritual context. I think there are a lot of um, analogies to be made and we can see how long it has taken for women to be accepted also within those very important um, upper spiritual leadership positions. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that is um, uh, unconnected. I think there's, I think it's really important actually. Yeah, Classic FM did a very entertaining, they're very good at doing entertaining articles, and they did one about women can't be conductors and here's why. And it was coming up with all the kind of ridiculous comments, like women's hands are too small, so they can't make the music go loud enough. <laughs> oh, I'm so um, sorry, I missed that. <laughs> oh, I'll send you the link. I'll, I'll put the link, yeah, I'll put the link in the podcast. It's really superb. And then it lists all the women conductors who are basically saying, well, you know, clearly we think this is nonsense. Um, yeah, the audience might get distracted by their hair. <laughs> yeah. Um, just all this kind of nonsense. Um, and it just, it's, it's been happening forever. I'm currently reading a great book by a writer called Nan Sloan, who is writing about women in the room. And it's about actually the foundation of the Labour Party. And it's all the history of men. And um, actually, but there were women present throughout the movement. So it's, you know, it's how women were present and hugely important but not seen and not recorded yeah and i think there was the huge change because we had the i think the proms had a lot to do here mm -hmm. and that was because they suddenly there was a sudden uptick in the number of female conductors mm -hmm. it wasn't gradual there was a signal suddenly they, they started programming a lot of female conductors and in a very very short space of time the idea of conductors being male and not fit, the idea that female conductors were unusual has completely changed. There's been a much greater um, acceptance of seeing women on, you know, on the podium with the stick. Um, and sometimes it's just having that presence. We had, um, we did a podcast looking at 
you know, trying to get black musicians. If you don't see yourself there, it's very hard to step to feel you're entitled to step into that role. So it's about embodying, seeing that role embodied um, to create that level, to make people feel, I can do that. Well, it does need to be normalized, certainly. Yeah. You know, when when it's all exceptional, then it it it's um, it does make it hard for for people to come through to see themselves in that to aspire to that. Um, but but I think what you said at the very beginning is really important, which is to say that there have been women conductors and women composers and women musicians at all levels for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the fact that they have been largely written out of histories um, and have and their um, their legacies have not been celebrated and people haven't been able to follow in their footsteps in the same way um, is uh, is not an accident, I'm afraid to say. And I think that perhaps there is a kind of a new awareness and a new consciousness being being raised at this time in history. Um, and I really, really hope so. I really hope that we don't slip back yet again um, and have to fight this battle again um, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Um, I want to believe that, but uh, but there were you know conductors on on the, the stage of the Royal Albert Hall in the, the turn of not the turn, but in the in, you know in the early 20th century, you know, but but that that is not part of the history that we're often handed down. Yeah, exactly. The other thing that I, I want us to examine is the idea of the self-fulfilling prophecy, because, you know, a lot of the rhetoric is like, oh, well, women aren't as good. They just don't do as well. But also, if you're not given the opportunity, you're not given the opportunity to fail. And that failure then is like, oh, well, it's inevitable because of your identity rather than everybody fails and you know, you and women are not given that space of classically not been given that space to be allowed to fail in the ways you have to have mm. failure as part of you know your professional development. It's not overall failure. It's the you know it's it's the learning growing process. Um, so there's that, and there's also the way people describe, as you say, they get written out. People talk about. I, I keep challenging this with my orchestra, saying. Mm. Don't talk about our audience. Don't talk about the repertoire because you are predetermining who that audience is. And for orchestras that are struggling, you know, classical music that's always complaining about struggling to get audience. If you predefine them, you're already you, you, you're on a hiding to nothing. If you're talking about the repertoire and we know what they think the repertoire is, you know, you're already creating a discourse that says this is already written. Mm. This is already written. You can't, you know, don't go back and twiddle. We all know what the, you know, who the greats are. We all know what the, what the history is. Mm. Um, but as you say, well, do we really? Do we, do we want to? And what does that say about how we go forward? What you're saying now um, makes me think about how we open this a little bit about um, orchestras being very tradition bound. And, and it makes me think... Um, about all the different reasons why people make orchestra music and why people listen to orchestra music. And there is a, a music sociologist, Christopher Small, who many years ago now, I think it was 1989, 1988, he, he wrote a scathing critique of, um, of the symphony orchestra concert as a ritual of the middle class um, which um, basically creates a very comfortable space, like a to to listen to our series of bedtime stories, stories which reaffirm um, that that middle class identity and um, just makes everything feel all right in its place. Um, and and I think you know it's a it's an interesting critique. I think it actually does flag up some things that really do need to be reviewed, but I don't think that um, orchestras are any specific thing. They are what we make of them. You know, it's a it's a group of people that 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 in in a way create a little 
people often like to think of it because as a society or a microcosm of society in and of itself, we can create any sort of set of interrelationships and any types of meaning making that we want to with this group. Does it afford um, sort of uh, performances of hierarchy and abuse? Does it afford the performance of um, power and domination? It does, but it doesn't have to. And I think that's the real difference. Um, is there a way to perform some of the most well-loved repertoire, perhaps that, that that we think of as being, I was just actually listening to um, Walton's Coronation March on the BBC Radio 3 yesterday, and I was trying to imagine in my mind that it could represent anything other than sort of imperial power and country and and actually quite a, a look back into uh, Edwardian glory um, and where I'm at today in terms of the ways in which um, the sounds and the gestures in that music have kind of embedded themselves in my consciousness as meaning specific things be really hard to unpick that and reassign it meaning. Can we, can we perform it in different spaces and in different ways? Can we critique it through our performance that it offers a different type of meaning making? Um, and, uh, and, and that's a, a real question. If, if we perform it for people who don't have those associations, what are we perpetuating? What are we creating? Um, can, can people um, appreciate and own that music for themselves if they know nothing about it, but simply love the way that it kind of makes them feel buoyant um, in, in perhaps a rather kind of innocent and fun loving way um, that 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 doesn't have all of those other connections. Um, and I think that's the thing that we have to remember is that none of the things that we play or the ways in which we play them um, are neutral. They are never politically neutral. They're always politically embedded. They're always politically charged. Um, and, you know, in the terms of kind of personal or global politics, you know, I think as musicians and as people who curate, you know, large public events, we have a duty to to think through um, all of those issues. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I mean, it, one I think a prime example this week was Cardiff deciding not to play the Tchaikovsky. They've taken a lot of flack mm -hmm. for that. But I have a little, I have sympathy on both sides. I mean, I kind of get with what's going on in Ukraine that I don't think they're out to get Tchaikovsky, um, who I think we can confidently say is innocent of any conflict in Ukraine. However, I think it was, they were doing the 1812. And that carries a whole different narrative of Russian military triumphs. I think the target wasn't really Tchaikovsky. It was that we haven't really got time to rethink how we present that piece in a way that is sensitive what's happening now, which I and I thought that was quite interesting because um, there was a lot of reaction to, you know, oh, you're cancelling Tchaikovsky, this is just ridiculous. But I could understand actually some of the more subtle thinking behind it. Um, so there was that one. And the other one, which I brought to our committee again, I was talking to somebody who we were offering um, free tickets for NHS workers. Yeah. And there was one particular nurse, I said, oh, you know, she'd had a bit of a rough time. And I said, why don't you come to the concert? Knowing that it was, you know, we were doing what you might consider was slightly more popular music, more well, film music. And I thought, you know, she might enjoy it. And she did come. But her response immediately was, oh, I, I couldn't come to your concert because I don't know anything about classical music. Mm -hmm. And it's really made me very sad, actually, because I said, well, if I'd invited you to a folk concert, you would never say, I can't come because I don't know anything about folk music. And I think that goes back to exactly the point you were making about classical music being that sort of middle class. It makes us comfortable and it also makes us feel that we belong to um, a group that has taste and discernment. Mm. And that's why people feel that unless you come and you somehow have that knowledge, it's like going to a banquet and not knowing which cutlery, you're, you know, you're faced with all this cutlery. And you're going to pick up the wrong knife and fork and the world you will be, you know, sneered at. And people do it in concerts. If people clap between movements, they, you know, people make a point of turning around and, you know, staring at them or tutting. And it's a way of saying, I'm part of the in crowd and you're not. Classical music is my way to, to assert my status. And we really need to take an axe to that. <laughs> It, you know, so that it's you, you actually bring up a really important point um, that 
does warrant more um, kind of discussion, which is who makes classical music and who attends classical music. And I think we often take professional orchestral music making and audiences as what orchestral performance is. Mm -hmm. Now, there are quite a few professional orchestras, but there are vastly more amateur and student orchestras, university and school orchestras across the globe than there are professional orchestras. Every day of the week, there is, I, I mean, Margaret, you, we, we could just kind of guess based on amateurorchestras.org.uk or whatever the, the website is, how many Monday night rehearsals there are, how many Tuesday night rehearsals are, Wednesday night rehearsals are, and you multiply those by the number of people making the music. And if you went in and you looked at the demographics, now, I am I'm not a, you know, kind of an economist sociologist that can talk about where exact lines are in terms of who constitutes middle class. But I think the imag our imagination of the orchestral concert going middle class is not actually the sort of people who are in large measure people who are playing in these groups. Yes, you'll mm -hmm. have your professionals, you'll have your doctors, you might have some of your lawyers, but you'll also have your cooks and the people that that work at the library and the people who yeah. who are actually food service workers and and work in construction believe it or not there are people who play orchestral instruments um may be coming from all sorts of different backgrounds and are there because they love playing they love the social element of it it gives them pride it's something that that is um important to them it really feeds their soul in an important way and then who they play to are their families and their friends and this happens every day in this country. It happens all the time in the U.S. It happens all the time, you know, across Europe. These, this, this other, this other side of orchestral music making, which is vast, um, you know, it's 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 huge swaths of people. And so I I think you know we it it does give us pause for thought when we say oh this is what classical music is doing. And we say actually. No, it's, it is already doing all of these things. And there have been numerous, numerous sort of um, like uh, revolutions or cash revolutions, something like the multi-story orchestra, for example, is taking mm -hmm. you know, music out of concert halls and putting it in different spaces and actually really thinking deeply about the sort of music they play, who plays it, who they're playing it for. Um, and, uh, and they're not the first ones. There's the real terrible orchestra, you know, we could talk about, but um, there is, it's, um, I think our gaze is often drawn back to, you know, the really large um, and established orchestras, which then make the definition of what this musical practice is about. And when we think of it in much broader terms, we see that people are taking it and doing all sorts with it all the time, all over the globe. Yeah, we've, we've interviewed alternative classical Hannah Fiddy on uh, the podcast right. before, and they just doing amazing work. And um, going back to, again, I keep coming back to my own orchestra, but um, one of the most fun things we did was a group of us got together and we did a series of informal sort of chamber music concerts. We did, you know, some of the, um, you know, sort of more established works and some, uh, we tried to do some more modern stuff. And we did them in a room, this rather wonderful room in a very in an old pub in Beverly that uh, unfortunately they don't have that room anymore, but it's a pub, it only has gas lighting and it has great beer. And we had it like a sort of cabaret thing and we encouraged people, people should, could come and go and get their drinks while we were playing. So it was that trying to undermine that piety mm. around that sense that you put on your best clothes and you go and you sit in reverential silence. Mm. For a passive experience which of course it isn't but that's how people can perceive it and that was so much fun mm. um and it was also doing with whole chamber music we did a relaxed concert where piano and violin and there were a lot of children scampering about and also people with um physical and mental disabilities you know who would maybe vocalize or have to keep moving because they couldn't you know sit and once you'd kind of adjusted to that, that's what the dynamic was. It was no less difficult to enjoy the music. Mm -hmm. In fact, in some ways, it was it was so joyful. It was just watching these children skipping about and had coloured scarves to play with. And the only rule was 
just don't touch the instruments. We don't, no little hands on the piano or the piano, but that's, you know, apart from that. And it was just as, you know, and there was a lot of background noise going on, but it was still a great concert. Yeah, I think, I guess, you know, going back to, to the point about who is this for, um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we can perhaps do better as, and when I say the industry, we'll call it the entire sort of ecosystem of, you know, student and amateur orchestras all the way up through, you know, the Scottish Chamber Orchestra and, and all the BBC orchestras. And I think if we think about it as that entire ecosystem, and we really think about what orchestral music um, is in all of its manifestations, it doesn't look quite so monolithic. There are fantastic projects, you know, the Open Orchestra, uh, the BSO Resound Orchestra, there are fantastic projects everywhere. If I was going to critique it, it would be that we still frame all of these other activities as other. So yeah. there is what orchestra mainstream there's mainstream and then fringe and there's fringe yeah. and and that fringe hasn't yet sort of pulled apart the you know the the mainstream but but there's always a bit of a conundrum there which is you know if i want to be if i actually want to be a revolutionary as my identity if there wasn't a mainstream for me to revolt against i mm -hmm. would be very disappointed um so there is how do you uh, how how you know it, and and not to say that that's a reason for not actually breaking down the mainstream. I'm not I'm not saying that in terms of the way that it's constructed currently, um, but but it is I think that is an enduring issue, which is there is the thing orchestral practice in its idealized form is this one mm -hmm. thing, and then all of these other engagements with it um, represent, as you say, fringe and other types of practice um, that all, are alternatives, but not the essential um the essential practice yeah the sort of platonic ideal mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. okay so i think as we're winding up can i shall i say is this a way that you would, would maybe sort of sum up where we're at with this conversation which i have to have enjoyed tremendously is that what we need to do is we must never assume we always know who we are that we must constantly as performing musicians, in, you know, especially in ensembles, and in, um, that we need to constantly investigate who we are and constantly investigate where we want to be, where we're going. But that is actually a helpful mindset to have when it comes to our, you know, our music practice. And and I, I guess I would add to that um, kind of really hyper awareness, not not just to perhaps who we are, but what what our actions say about what we value, and mm -hmm. that that is from what we program to where we um, spend our time and energy to uh, break down the the barriers to meaningful engagement in this musical practice um you know where where are our values and how is that reflected in in our priorities um and and i just you know every time i program something i ask okay um what does it mean to program this piece what am i platforming um who am i who am I giving my time and the resources that I might be able to influence? Um, to, to whose voice am I am I dedicating those? And and what am I really communicating to my audiences and to my players and to the world when I do that? Am I reaffirming that yes, Beethoven is the greatest composer of all time, and we all need to recognize that and celebrate that? Or am I, you know? showing actually a, a different voice altogether, a different perspective on what the symphony can be um, and and actually given some great amount of attention and um, energy to uncovering that in a way that's meaningful yeah. for the group. Um, so I think 
but yes, what what does what do our actions mean? How do they reflect our priorities? What are we communicating? And what is the opportunity cost? What haven't we done with all of that time and money, quite frankly? Um, and so how can you really defend a particular, you know, action, concert, programming, choice, et cetera? Yeah, no, no, I think that's, I think you've nicely rounded off what I started as in, because if we have that level of self interrogation constant, then that feeds into the consequences of how we then act and how we, uh, you know, mm. how that, how that is then manifest in, um, in how we become effective in that wider musical practice. That's terrific. I think that's a really good note to end on, a really positive one. Kenneth, thank you. This has been, a, for me, it's been a terrific conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. <laughs> it's been wonderful to talk to you, Margaret. Thank you no. so much for having me on your show. No, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you for taking the time. And um, I'm sure we will have more conversations like this in the future because I think, you know, there's a lot of important work here that once you start looking and you, you it's encouraging you know, the signs are there. These are the kind of conversations that need to be had. And I say are being had. So I'm glad that we've had a chance to contribute to that. Can I just um, say before yeah. you sign off, um, yeah. if you ever did have me back on this on this show, I would love to share with you um, some of the really exciting orchestral music that is coming out of Afghanistan today. Ooh, yeah. Not yes. where we expected to see it. So I'll just leave that there and say oh, that, yes. we have another chat. That would be fantastic. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Kayana and Margaret. We've looked at hierarchy and representation on the podcast before, but this conversation has really taken the discussion to another level and left us with much food for thought on how we take our practice as ensembles and music organisations forward in ways that challenge unhelpful and restrictive attitudes and structures. You can find more information about Kayana and her work on her website, kayanaponchion.com. And we hope to invite her back soon to tell us more about her amazing work with the musicians of Afghanistan, including Ensemble Zora, the country's first all-female orchestra. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Works podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, check out our other great episodes, and even better, leave us a review. You can also sign up to our mailing list at www.polyphonyarts.com forward slash mailing dash list for updates and news about what Polyphony Arts is up to for all you classical music folk out there. You can find more information in the show notes as well. Meanwhile, I'm Katie Beardsworth and I look forward to sharing with you the next great episode of Music Works. Music Works is generously supported by Alliance Musical Insurance the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Alliance Music Insurance, serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. Music Works is a Polyphony Arts production. Thank you for listening.